Ladies and gents, I'm about to make you love the 21st century so f***ing hard. I did way back a video on birth control in the apocalypse. If you want to check that out, link in the description down below, also card up here. And a couple people requested that I cover the fantasy side of things. So that's what we're doing today. And that involves taking a little look into historical birth control methods, which it turns out were pretty freaking horrible. So first I'm gonna cover the historical and then I'm gonna cover some magical creative options you can use. Now quick writing disclaimer, you should keep your mention of birth control pretty small. We like some explanation, but you don't need to get super specific. So here are the top 11 historical forms of birth control, and I'm going to count the list backwards, because that's what we're doing now. So historical birth control method number 11, I don't have enough fingers. Lead, mercury, or other toxic sh It turns out this is actually extremely effective. Why? Because you can't get pregnant if you're dead. Game of Thrones used tansy, which is an herb which used frequently or in high amounts would lead to your internal organs literally rotting away. And I don't think you want that for your characters. Method number 10. This one sounds really funny. Lemon diaphragm. Surprisingly, this has actually kind of worked. Not well, of course, because it's a lemon. You're just you're chopping off the top of a lemon and just shoving it up inside yourself. But it actually did work a little bit. And that's mainly just because lemon juice works as a spermicide because it's highly acidic. And I guess the top of the lemon could potentially keep a little bit of the sperm out, but given in current modern day, we've kind of stopped using diaphragms because even the plastic diaphragms are not very effective. I'm gonna go ahead and guess that a lemon diaphragm does not work much better. Also, that just sounds kind of uncomfortable. I'm pretty sure that sticking lemon juice all up in your private parts would not be a very fun time. Method number nine. This one comes from 1800 BCE in Egypt. And this one is a lovely mix of crocodile dung and honey. This was also used in India, except they used elephant dung because I guess they didn't have enough crocodiles around and you can just substitute any kind of dung you want, I guess. It sounds really ridiculous, but it actually worked stupidly well. The concoction worked as a spermicide due to its acidic properties, so it actually did prevent a lot of pregnancies. But I don't recommend you use this in your fantasy book because we can't really get behind our ship getting it off when all we can think about is the horrible yeast infections that the main character is gonna get from all that honey in her vagina. Also, the crocodile dung is a little bit gross. It's also worth mentioning that this method seems to have cropped up all over the world, all over history. Always with honey, but always with a different type of dung. And although the crocodile version worked in large part because of acidity, a lot of the other versions actually worked because it turns out when you get a horrible uterine infection, you generally have a septic abortion and you lose the child. So technically, the other forms were effective, but not in a very pretty way. Method 9.5. I just realized this doesn't work very well when you're counting in reverse because that is counting back the other direction rather than downwards, but we're gonna go with it. And I'm calling this one Crocodile Dung 2.0. This less exciting method took honey and instead of mixing it with crocodile dung, mixed it with asiasia? As asa Acacia. Asasia leaves or unripe fruit, which was then put on a cotton ball or lint and inserted into the vagina. This came in Egypt in 1600 BCE, so this was the evolved version of the plain crocodile dung method. And this worked because Asasia gum ferments into lactic acid, which is a spermicide. Method number eight. This is a Greek and Roman method which involved mixing olive oiter, olive oil, why do you say oiter? Olive oil, cedar resin, Basam tree juice and honey. I don't know why honey was so commonly used in these birth controls, but seems to be a very common ingredient. This mixture was also sometimes mixed with lead, which again is very effective because it can cause death. But even without the lead, it was said that this could decrease the motility of sperm, giving the woman time to go rinse out all her lady bits. I'm not sure how effective that actually was. We don't have a lot of data, but I'm gonna guess not that great. Method number seven. This was started by ancient Egyptians who seemed to be involved in a lot of birth control methods. 
and then later crops up all over history in different forms. This one is vaginal fumigation. Doesn't that sound lovely? So with vaginal fumigation, a woman would straddle hot stones, drip an herb solution on them so that the steam could go up into their vagina and supposedly prevent pregnancy. Sometimes they used a tube, and later in history people used things like steamed onions, so they'd crouch over a pot of boiling onions. Method number six, dick squeezing. Yeah, that was a thing. This was sort of an early, half-assed, almost approximation to men getting snipped, I guess. The theory was that if you press hard enough on the vas deferens, you prevent anything from getting out and thus theoretically prevent pregnancy. This was probably terribly useless. At that point, you could just pull out, which doesn't actually work. Method number five, animal intestine or linen tied onto the dick with a ribbon. The ribbon is a nice little touch. And this was the ancient's equivalent of plastic wrap kept on with a rubber band. Laugh all you want, but I legit know a guy who tried this. Not with me, with someone else. But I had a friend who tried this, and it turns out it works 100%. Because the rubber band cut off all the blood to his dick, which then went numb, which kind of ruins the mood. I like to imagine that slapping on an animal intestine probably does the same thing. But this was actually one of the more innovative forms of birth control that was used in history. And that's because they were actually quite a bit effective, not for preventing STDs as condoms do today, because of what molecules could and couldn't get through the barrier of the intestine, but sperm couldn't get through, so it was at least useful for preventing pregnancy. Now that's a sausage. Method number four. This one is really fun. I think we should bring this one back. Method number four is sneezing. Yeah, that was one. Sneeze the sperm out. I don't think I need to go any further into this because the Greek gynecologist Soranos, who suggested this, didn't feel the need to explain it any further either. He just told women to sneeze. Sorry, I messed that up. He told women to hold their breath and then sneeze. Method number three, stepping over a viper? I don't think any women actually tried this. I like to imagine that they realized that that was not a very useful form of birth control, but this was suggested by a Roman scholar by the name of Gaius Secundus and was actually written into a science book that he wrote. This scholar also had the very strong belief that menstruating women killed bees. I don't know where that came from. But on the other hand, getting bit by a viper would probably induce abortion, so there's that. But if that's the angle you're going for, I'm pretty sure drinking mercury would be easier than going out into the forest and trying to find a viper. Method number two, sticks and bones. And note they were not used to break men's stones, though that would have also been an effective method of birth control. These sticks and bones were instead used to shove up into the uterus to induce abortion. Now, as someone who knows from experience how much it hurts to get an IUD inserted by a medical professional in the 21st century, I'm not even gonna go into details for this method. And last but not least, historical birth control method number one. This one is my favorite, and that is weasel testicles. Women would tie weasel testicles around their neck or leg or around a pretty little garter belt. And this was probably about 60% effective because about 60% of men would not f a woman wearing a necklace of weasel testicles. And can you blame him? I wouldn't expose my testicles to a confirmed testicle harvester. And then the one useful, truly useful historical method of birth control, which doesn't get a number in this list because I didn't add a number in the script and so it's just off here on its own, but it deserves to be on its own because it's the only one that was truly good. And this is silphium, which was a Greek form of birth control. This worked as both abortion and prevention, either as juice drunken once a month or soaked onto cotton, which was then inserted into the vagina. There is an actual confirmed extreme drop in birth rate at the time that the Greeks started using this. It's effective, it's not disgusting, it's not weird, and it doesn't even cause death. Now we can't test the plant to find out the actual scientific effectiveness of it as a birth control method because it worked so well that it was aggressively over harvested and went extinct. 
Good job, ancient Greek people! This was actually so heavily worshipped, probably because of its extreme effectiveness and not being disgusting, that it was actually put on coins. Imagine a penny, but instead of Lincoln's head on it, there was an IUD. I'm not saying it's weird, but it's kind of weird. There were some other plants that were used with less historically shown drops and birth rates, and these plants include Queen Anne's Lace, Willow, Date Palm, Pomegranate, Penny Royale, Artemisia, Meyer, and Root. Some of these plants work just because they're toxic, but Queen Anne's Lace specifically is actually confirmed to have some anti-fertility properties when used immediately after sex and is actually still used in India today. So overall, from my research into historical birth control methods, Silphium seems to be the only really good option. So good they went and killed it, which is kind of really sad. It's pretty clear that the vast majority of those aren't things you can use in your fantasy book. So let's instead cover some magical options. Method number seven, magic spells or liquid control. Fetus deletus? No? Okay, how about asiosperm? More acceptable, but possibly more messy for the user. In terms of the liquid control one, there is actually a book that did it. And that is Symphony of Ages, where Ash, the main character, uses his ability to control liquid to keep his sperm from entering the woman's body. Now I haven't read that book, so I don't know how well that actually reads in the context of a book, but it was used. Number six, an amulet or another magical object. Maybe an amulet containing the souls of a hundred ballless weasels. No? I mean, you don't have to specify that the souls are of weasels. You could always go the vague route, but this is a fairly common one used in fantasy. Method number five. Potions made out of the ground up testicles of beavers. Wait. This one belongs in the historical section. Yeah, Canada had a thing against weasels. Or beavers. However you choose to look at it. So they threw out the weasels and went with beaver balls instead, and being the clever little things that they were, they decided consumption was a better method than tying the balls around one's leg. And it actually turns out it was a little bit effective because of the testosterone in the beaver's balls, I guess. Number four, magical sterility. Like how the female vampires in Twilight were supposedly sterile because their bodies stay exactly how they were when they died or whatever. Now can we pause a moment because I've always had a super annoying question about that. What about the women who died pregnant? Do they just stay pregnant forever? Does the baby inside them become a vampire? How does that work? I don't know if I actually want answers. But yeah, magical sterility is a common method of birth control in fantasy novels. Either through characters that have some sort of curse or characters that are unable to reproduce because of whatever magical category they fall into. For example, in Witcher, the witchers are sterile because of deliberate mutations that they went through to become witchers. Method number three, the he's from this magical other species and there's no historical record of pregnancy ever working between this magical other species and this plain human girl method, otherwise called chromosome mismatch. If your one character is human and your other character is some other kind of species like elves or dwarfs or whatever and they happen to have a different chromosome number, you can use this. Also, if there's some other sort of incompatibility to where they wouldn't be able to reproduce, you can also use this. But remember, if you use this once, you can't magically have them have a baby later because reasons. Method number two, magical control over one's body. Sadly, humans don't have this, but there are actual animals that do. Certain rodents can hold their uterus hostage until the male has shown them a good time. And a lion herd, herd? It's heard the right word? Lion pride. <laughs> A lioness with cubs, which take about 25 weeks to rear, can magically, seemingly magically, not get pregnant despite having sex. Also in times where a new male has taken over, the female's body will delay ovulation for a time, likely to ensure that the new male can keep his position as leader before she commits to him. Now this probably isn't in any way a conscious decision on the part of the lioness, but if your character can actively sprout wings or heal a gash in the manner of an hour, you can get away with saying, that she can control her ovulation. And this was actually used in the Drygera series. Magical fantasy method of birth control number one is divine intervention. And this is where the woman can only get pregnant if she says a prayer or lights a candle or whatever. The biologist in me cringes here. I know it's magic. I get it, but how was anyone born before they had language or the knowledge of these deities or the candles? 
Like, I have so many questions. I don't like this one. Kushiel's legacy does this apparently, where they had to pray to their god and light a candle and ask the god to open up their womb. And again, I ask you, how was anyone born before the time when candles were invented? So yes, this one is widely accepted, but I cannot personally endorse it. And now for my conclusion and what I think is probably your best option to go with for writing birth control and fantasy. Potions or concoctions made from herbs. I mean, you've made up this entire fantasy world, so inventing a plant really isn't that much of a stretch. It's perfectly believable. And then just have your characters turn that plant into a potion or a tea. You could say they drink it once a month or that they drink it right after sex. I personally like tea here because they can carry the dry leaves around with them. All they need is hot water. The leaves won't go bad. You can even make it readily available for wild romps in the forest. And best of all, it doesn't read as unrealistic because again, we had Silphium back in Greek times, which was an actual wild herb that people would drink once a month and it worked as a form of birth control. And maybe it's one of the more common methods, but it's also tried and tested. And when it comes to birth control, you just need a tiny line telling your readers that that's something you considered and something that your characters are responsible enough to consider. It doesn't need to be super innovative. And yeah, that was it for this video. If you write post-apocalyptic or dystopia, then check out the video linked in the description down below. If you liked this video or you found it helpful, make sure to give it a like and a share. It really helps this channel grow and I truly appreciate it. Remember to subscribe and hit that bell. And thank you guys so much for watching. As always, I will see you in the next video.